So you want to talk about archery and write a book. Well, my name is Roy Canterbury on Arch Talk 101 today. We have an author and an archery enthusiast on the line with us. Michael Perry, welcome to the show. I appreciate you having me. You know, good to be here. Yeah, uh, tell us a little bit, something about yourself, um, you know, how you got started, when you got started in archery. Yeah, I uh, live in Alabama. I'm a 12-hour swing shift plant worker. Uh, I got my start in outdoors when I was young, trapping, because uh, I lived like in a little small town, so trapping was the best thing I could do. At that time, I didn't really have no deer around, so a little bit later, we moved all back to where my grandpa was at on a 40-acre farm our family did, and there's a lot of land that was around that worked with trap and do a squirrel hunt and stuff like that, but deer wasn't, you had to go travel around to get to deer and stuff, so my dad was, uh, he liked, uh, back then, he was an archery hunter with a recurve, and, and before they come out with the compounds and stuff, so he was, he was, he was pretty successful doing that, so I picked up archery as young and didn't really get started to get serious with it, so I was probably in my 20s, but every year now, I'm, I'm taking a bow or you know, sometimes I'll take a recurve with me. I haven't, the only thing I've killed with it so far is a, is a black bear, but you know, kill quite a few deer with a compound now. So. But I love the outdoors and we're mainly public lands. So I do a few trips over 90 and we got it, but most of our, our passion is white tails on public land. So that's pretty much what we do here. That's good. You have a lot of good public land to hunt. Mm, yeah. Yeah, we got some big deer in some places, so, you know, the possibility of big deer. It's not like uh, northern states or western states, but we've got some good ones. So. Yeah, each, each deer in each area is a little bit different in size and characteristics, and I know up here in Nebraska and Iowa, we have some big body deer, and, you know, some of them down south, they, they don't have as big of bodies, and it's just right. all different. Right, yeah, we'd be lucky to get one 200 pound. I've killed I've not killed one with a bow over 200 pounds, but several with a gun, but uh, the biggest one with a bow was like 180 pounds. He, he, he scored real good. He was 140 something inch. That's the biggest one I've killed with a bow. So and that's real good on public land. So, but you know, yeah. most of the year, especially bow hunting, I'm not quite as picky. I'll say I try to be eight point around his ears, you know, if we can, if, or if we need meat, it don't have to be that. So. Yeah. Yeah. If you just want meat, those work just fine. <laughs> right. So, so. Yeah. But it's it's tough, you know, especially on public land, you know, getting them close enough for a shot. So you you're not too picky sometimes. But. Yeah, I know you you wrote a, a book um, about hunting public land. Right. Tell us a little bit about um, you know why you decided to write the book. Well, I've, for a 14 years or so, I've done some uh, public land hunting advisors for a, a magazine called Alabama, Alabama Outdoor News and. Uh, it, it had kind of went out of business because the magazine business is tough now. And, and I've wrote a few, you know, bigger articles and stuff like that for magazines. So, but uh, after I killed a, I killed a state record deer with a muzzle loader, and I thought, you know, it's always been kind of interesting writing a book. So I thought after I'd done that, I had enough street credit basically to, to write a book about hunting. So it's got a, it kind of tells how I've killed several deer and then a few tips and stuff like that, tactics and postseason counting scouting tactics and some other things so it just and it was kind of like a lifetime dream or a life achievement thing just some something to something ready to leave behind i'm getting a little old, older i'm 58 so like i say so i just just something i'm proud to have done and uh, it got published this past august so it's it, so uh, i you know i really enjoyed it it was kind of painstaking a little bit but i learned a lot and then uh, really enjoyed it and proud of it so yeah, and and nice thing about the, those that get to watch the video is I can actually show you on uh, Amazon uh, the book right here. Here's here's the book he wrote. There's him with his deer, um, Black Warrior Wildlife Management Area in Alabama, and you know here's the book. So you know if you're interested, in check check it out. Yeah, yeah, do that. I appreciate it. So appreciate you uh, showing that and uh, showing the link. So. Yeah, and, and I can just go out there and find it. You know, it's I, I just looking on your your profile. I seen that picture. It's like, oh, so I went out to Amazon because it looked like it was an Amazon on post. Uh, uh, so I went out there and looked, and sure enough, it, it's out there. And um, like we kind of alluded before the thing started, there's other Michael Perry's out there, but this is the one that you wrote. The other there's you have 
you have a clone name out there. <laughs> Another <laughs> author, author with the same name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of yeah. fun because some people asked me about that a while back. And I said, no, it's not me. I just wrote the hunt book. I didn't write them other books. So, so. <laughs> yeah, I was beginning to wonder, you know, because when you go out there and search for it, it'll be there. And and I can leave a link in the description uh, to make it easier for those that want to go out and get your book to to get it. And, you know, that that's something that's, you know, it sounds interesting. I, I appreciate that. So. I'll, have, I'll have to get it and take a look at it. Wait. Yeah. So what, um, it, I'm sure you've got some stories on, on hunting public land, because that's mostly what you hunt then, I'm assuming, is is public lands. Right. Yeah, we've, uh, I've made a few trips on different public lands. You know, I went, we've been to Wyoming several times, bow hunting. I took a Spock Stock 2 mule deer with a bow in uh, Wyoming on uh, Thunder Basin National Grass Plans. And uh, also uh, shot a, a two, year, two and a half year old whitetail out of a lock on, hunting right by the Cheyenne River on public land. And it's kind of a historical river, you know, so that was pretty neat. Yeah. I was proud of that. I actually shot a white tail in a, in a mule deer with my brother on the spot stalker in three day period on public land. So that was, that was pretty cool and just, just an awesome trip. So been there several times, been a, a couple other states have not been successful for deer hunting yet, but have seen several and passed up several with like mode loader and, and some bow stuff waiting on, you know, say bigger deer or more, more respectable deer for the states like uh, Illinois and uh, Iowa. So, then uh, I plan on might go to, I think we're looking to try to put in for a drawing in Kansas this year, then maybe Missouri, if that don't don't uh, pan out for the Kansas thing. So uh got a couple guys that want, we like putting in like a little group, that way you got some hunting buddies to go and stuff like that. You got somebody to help you out if you need anything. So, but yeah, we are, we really love outdoors and traveling. I've been to Canada several times, black bear hunting. And all that with a bow, let's say one with a recurve. Uh, been out to Alaska, but that's that's mainly with a rifle, a uh, big bear hunting and stuff like that, brown bear and stuff like that. You can you can see the video, you can see yeah, <laughs> a lot of that in the back right back there. And so uh, a, a lot of other animals interest me in 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 different styles of hunting. You know, I love bow hunting. We have a a split season. Well, not really a split season. We can start out archery hunting here in, in October 1st and hunt all the way to February 10th and with bow hunting. And the public lands that I hunt there have specific gun days. And then on them days, we're usually hunting rifles because it's, it's it's tougher with the bow then. And then we'll go right back to bow hunting the next day after the gun hunt. So uh, that makes it interesting and fun. So we got a long season in Alabama longer than, you know, a lot of states. So, and it's, it, we may my wife will take her camper set up camp and camp for a couple of weeks at a time and, and just enjoy the outdoors and promote that with other people and other families and, and kids and stuff like that. Try to get them outdoors and try to put the phones and stuff down a little bit and take a breath of fresh air and uh, enjoy what we got. Yeah. Th does she shoot a bow as well, your wife? She shoots a bow and she's trying to get her strength back up. She's she's small framed and and, and pulls less than 40 pounds of the the first deer she ever killed was with a bow. She killed one with a bow. She killed one with a crossbow. So she's she's my uh, most loader. She's been she's a, she can shoot anything you put in her hand basically. So so she's That's a well good. yeah she's a well rounded little hunter. So. Yeah, and and you don't have to shoot a lot of you know draw weight to kill a deer. No, no. you know you just got to stay within your range. It, you know. I was talking to some guys earlier and his wife was shooting, you know, like 42 pounds, but she knows her range is 15 yards and you shoot right. within your range. Whether you're a guy or, or you know, a lady, you got to right. know what your effective range is and stay within it. Exactly you know, right. That's, that's the whole thing is if you not, you know, you don't have confidence and you get that by practicing. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, 38 pounds is what she's pulling all in. And uh, the, the legal weight in Alabama is 35 pounds, and that's you know that's that's not that's not a big deal there. So, so if you pull 35 in Alabama, you you can you can you can take a deer easily. So, yeah, you're just not gonna go take those 60, 70 yard shots. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> At that way, you'd be way high shooting. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't hardly even do that with a with a shooting a 70 pound compound. You know, I shot a couple like a 50 yard, but most of the time. The way we hunt, the way you set up, you don't. You're setting up for a lot closer shots, and 
most of the shots I do on deer are something that's less than 10 yards. So. Yeah, I, I, like to, I like to set up for 20 yard shot, mm -hmm. but they never listen. They always come in closer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, My, was, that makes it thrilling. But. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've had them walk underneath my stand and and everything else, and it just comes like, ah, you're too close, you're too hard to shoot. It's straight down. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that was some of my worst shots. Is whether it be about three or four yards, I'd always pull left or right or something until like until I got one of them bubbles on my sight where I make sure I was putting camp my bow. So yeah, so, so I'd rather them be about 12, 13 yards out. So but. Them close ones that they'll do it. That, like you say, if you ain't expecting, they're gonna be close closer than you want. So. Yeah, and, and they just they, they don't cooperate. That you know that's why we're doing that. It's all different. Yeah, especially like where we hunt, we're mainly big woods hunters, and we don't really hunt uh, fields or anything. So you're not hunting food plots. So you're trying to hunt transition edges and pinch points and stuff like that, or maybe a trail going to white oaks or some kind of you know food source to. So you don't, and bucks, if you're hunting bucks, they almost stay on the trail most of the time. They, they're always pop out where you least expect them. So then they'll right. be right under you or something. So. And, and hunting in the the woods, you don't have them long shots anyway. No, very rare. So most of the time, you know, early archer season is so green, you can't see past 15, 20 yards anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's just so much there. And then when the leaves aren't there, you still can't shoot because all the little beady branches from the brush is in the way. Right. Yeah, and most of the time down here, where our leaves won't drop till not mid November. So we're, you know, you have to push through that for a while. So, but I kind of like it better like that because it's easier to get in cover. And you don't, you know, you know, you can hide your movement a little better and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's it's all just you know that's the thing I learned. You know, setting up stands and getting busted, and then they come back again, and they're looking up in the tree, and then you know, finally I decide, you know. I figured out, you know, because I didn't have anybody teach me how to do this. I'm just learning on my own. And, uh, and you know, I was like, okay, if you open a tree stand and they look up at you and they don't just kind of move on, move your stand because you're uh, not going to, you're not going to get there. And then, it, then I got to look and I was like, yeah, look up my tree stand. I was like, I know why I were seeing it because there's nothing behind me. You know, the trail uh, comes walking and I'm just kind of silhouetted, you know, like for those that get to see, um, let's see this, this side over here. You know, you're standing up like this guy. Um, uh, <laughs> for those listening to him, my background has a picture of a bow hunter uh, full draw into a uh, deer, and he's standing on top of the hill, so he's skylighted. The the uh, sky is behind him. Um, you know, so I'm listening to this, so I got how to explain it once in a while. And uh, what I say uh, for those that don't get to watch this, you know, in your background, you're in in one of your rooms there, and there's deer heads all over. There's bear uh i'm not sure what all is there but all kinds of stuff yeah you got pronghorn antelope you got a moose but i got from new brunswick canada and i'll turn around right here you can see a mountain lion and my brother's big 180 inch deer and my dip my bigger deer got a full body mount that i killed with the mobile that's the state record deer and then some more big deer all these are alabama public land and that big one right in the center of the wall is my best archery buck who's a so he made several record books and he's 142 inch. And then over here in this corner right here is my wife's deer that she's taking her own public land and this big old black bear. She took it with a crossbow and it weighed 400 and something pounds as a whopper. It's the biggest black bear we've got in the house. So it's, uh, we've done a variety of hunts and enjoy it completely. So we just, and I love mounting them. So we built a room that's, it's, it's pretty good size. But, to put a bunch of our stuff on it because it, it's all awesome memories that you you know make with your family and friends and stuff like that. So we just we just love it. So we don't we don't we don't take it for granted. You know, we just try to appreciate everything that happens and and every every kill that we do. So. Yeah, and every time you see it, then you, you it brings back you know refreshes a memory uh, of that the hunt you had and all the excitement you had and you know uh, all the things you've went through and um what's you know speaking of that what is your most memorable hunt that archery one is is very memorable because i i tried so hard I, I didn't kill my first good buck until i was 31 years old i kind of i was in the navy for five years after the teenager and uh was you know gone and didn't really get back into deer hunting later until i'm mid-20s and and my brother killed that big old 180 and I just got more serious about it. And that was one of my goals to try to kill a, a big one with a 
bow and it whenever that happened they, i was so excited and they were so proud because it took forever it seemed like to, to get one of that size and then the the muzzleloader one was real was one real memorable because i had him on camera for a couple of years and i was actually targeting this deer and it worked out so that that was that was you know just really a a crazy moment just a a big sigh or, or just couldn't really believe that it happened because most of the time when I have a big deer on camera and a lot of people can relate to it, you don't never see them in, in person or, you know, so, and when it happened, I couldn't believe it. So it, it so that one was real exciting, but the archery one is, is one of the best ones. So, because that's, that's, it just takes everything to be so perfect for a big mature buck to get an archery range. And then you got to hold yourself together to make <laughs> that shot. <laughs> so, so because uh, because anything you could do just the slightest thing wrong and and miss you know so or or you put some something you're not see like a twig or whatever you know it's just a lot of things that's got to be perfect for something like that to happen especially in the big woods on public land so that was one of the proudest things I've ever done so yeah and and public lands can be you know a real challenge you know because people just come through all times days and night and. I know one public land I used to hunt all the time is, is also a place you can go camp and there's lakes there and it's right next to the river. So you just kind of bound so far you couldn't go too far because you really couldn't get lost because you could run to the river or run into a fence or run out into the camping area. So no matter where you're at, you're not going to get lost because if you don't climb a fence, you know you're still on their property. And right. and you'll have people come walking through in the middle, middle of the, the perfect hunting time. And I remember one time. I was, I was up there hunting and I heard this right at shooting time, this bracket, something was making all kinds of noise going through the reeds. And I thought it was somebody just walking through perfect time. No, it turned out to be a buck it was walking through, made all kinds of noise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then other times like, where'd you come from? You know, all of a sudden you look down and here's a deer standing next to you, you know, your tree stand. And... Yeah. I've had a very similar thing happen to me one time where we got, We've had a problem with the wild pig, you know, the feral pigs in our area too. And one day I was sitting in on, I think it was a walk on, well, it was by a creek crossing. Anyway, I heard a bunch of dang racket just behind me, just sound like stuff breaking, just making all kind of dang racket. I said, it was a big old pig coming. So I never, I should have got up and got kind of turned around and looked, but I didn't. I was going to wait till it got beside me. And when I did, it got beside me as a nice buck. And he, evidently, he'd been rubbing trees and stuff like Evan, but he just made all kind of racket. By the time I could get up, he done crossed the creek and was 60 yards away. So I uh, actually, so I messed up. I paid attention, got up and took it, you know, verified what it was. You know, I would have had a chance at him, but, and, you know, just being, just being stupid, really just. Just thinking that you knew what was going on, and I didn't really for sure. I should have verified it, and it was a nice buck. So he's gone. So that's one that I didn't get. So. You learned. <laughs> yeah, I learned. Yeah, yeah learned when it's something. Here's something coming. You got to assume it's what you want, and then verify, and then and then you, you, at least you're ready. Uh, you know, like they say, better to be ready than not not need it than need it and not be ready, right? exactly right so that's, that's one of the things you learn you know like you say about you teaching yourself about stand placement and hunting and stuff like that you'll go through a lot of pain and, and a lot of problems and heartache because you know because you just it's just gonna happen so you just got to get through them things and learn from each one of them and try not to make that mistake twice so. right so. yeah you're all going to make a mistake sooner or later you know there's there's no archer out there that's that has hunted for very long that hasn't made a mistake the only one that hasn't made a mistake is the one that's never taken a shot. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> if you take, and the mistake was not taking a shot, probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all go through that where we, you know, we get out there and uh, I, at one time, I completely missed. There's no way I should have missed this deer. Well, and I'm thinking, it's like, so I take another field tip I have with me and I pick out a leaf and I hit it dead right in the middle of the leaf. You know, a little bit small leaf, but I missed a whole great big deer. And I'm thinking, Max, like, <laughs> Huh, I forgot to aim. <laughs> I just drew back and shot. I I didn't even aim. It's just something, you know, something didn't click right in, you know. And then I, I know people they'll they'll put pick your spot on the limb, you know, printed on a paper on their limb. You know, pick your spot. So kind of see it, pick your spot. Uh, yeah, pick a hair, pick you know something. That's true. So it, I mean, 
that can happen very easily because you know especially when you get older i know she got glasses on when you, when you start fighting that sight a little bit you know trying to trying to look through a page to a pen to, to a target you know. I, I i have two pair this this pair is just for the computer and reading and the other pair is there for everything else because otherwise if i had these on trying to look i'd be like this you know my head would be all up because <laughs> i can only see through the bottom of them and you know you get a little older and then you know, you start, you know, as you get older, you get start cataracts start forming. Not bad enough for them to do anything about it, but bad enough that not everything's blurry. <laughs> yeah. It don't get easier as you get older, it gets harder. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. It's, uh, well, that's why everybody says, you know, taking them long shots, you know, here, here's a shot at 100 yards and they're nailing it. It's like, I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> if it's over about 40 it's like yeah i'm it's too blurry i'm not going to be able to see it I, i'm not going to take those and uh, my first my very first deer i was up 20 feet up in a tree you had to get that high to get over the brush to the trail and right. the trail was about 40 yards away and i took the deer come by standing you know broadside i took my shot deer turns around the arrows hanging almost completely through and I'm shooting 52 pounds, uh, full length aluminum arrow with 125 or 145 grain dip on it. It was heavy. It was slow. And that thing, almost, I must hit it just perfectly as it turned around. My arrow was, I could see my arrow hanging out the other side. Um, I think that stopped at the fletching is how <laughs> far I went through. And, uh, and that was my first year. It wasn't a big one, but, you know, hey, you know, like like tell my kids when the, their first year, um, shoot it. Right. If it's a deer, shoot it. Now, the second one, we're going to talk about letting fawns walk. But, right. <laughs> you know, just the first one, just whatever you get a chance to take it. And then after that, you know, then we start being picky about, you know, what want to take, you know, just get the experience, you right. know, yeah. get, get that first one out. Yeah, yeah, you got to work through the experience to, to learn what to do for the next time or what to make things better, you know. So, so you got to start somewhere, so, you know, because... If a big boy comes around there or whatever, you know, if you don't have any kind of experience shooting or taking a shot at a live animal, I mean, you could, you know, miss completely and just hurt yourself or maybe make a bad shot either way. But you've got to start out. And then I would, I would just soon, you know, shoot 10 or 15, 20 there if you can before you get too serious because there's a lot of stuff you've got to work out in, in the woods right. and then whatever. So. You know, and see what makes you happy, you know, and set goals, you know, try to set goals and, and stick with that maybe. So, but, but don't worry about anybody else or, or, uh, or what size of deer or whatever. Just, you know, make yourself happy. So. Yeah. And, you know, I, I go out, you know, a lot of times I'm going out, I'm just going out for the meat. You know, if a buck comes by, a buck comes by, but I'm, I'm more, I want meat in the freezer and, and, you know, doe comes by, you know, I'm going to take a doe. But if a buck comes by, I'm not turning it down, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, and when I first started in, in our training, we got two deer. That's all we could get tags for. Um, and that that's all there was. And archer was always either sex, rifle, sometimes were, you know, buck only. And, you know, so you got two tags. So the first deer would be, you know, whatever deer was, I'd take it. And then I'd wait till December before I'd fill it with another dough. Otherwise I'd wait for bucks because I had meat in the freezer. So uh, that was kind of how I did it. And then then as I got better at knowing how to cook it and everything else, you know, one deer don't last long, you know, especially growing up my kids, my uh, kids like it, you know, it, I, I would tell my freezer was full. And, and so I had another deer and I had no place to put it. So I started making jerky out of it. And the kids are like, okay, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Yeah. I think that deer lasted about two weeks <laughs> and we ate the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. As fast as I could make the jerky, they were eating it. <laughs> That's why our son, we only have one, one child, a son. And if we made jerky or, or a snack stick, they wouldn't last for nothing. So you, you had to hide them from him because they, him and his buddies and friends, they, they'd get into it and they'd be gone in a few days. So. Yeah. That's, that's what's nice when you have a freezer full of meat. You can, you can go ahead and make a jerky out of the whole deer. And now I do a lot of processing myself. I don't know if you do or not, but I, I do a lot myself because in that way, I know exactly how the meat was treated. I know it is my meat and not somebody else's. You take them to the, the processing plants and, you know, you see them hanging in there and, and, you know, okay, did I get my deer back or I get somebody else's? And especially, you know, like on a rifle season, I went in one of them 
and, and here there's some of these deer hanging up and some of the meat's green and real dark almost black and they're like okay i don't want none of that and uh, and then then you come back and what uh, two of my friends took one in one time to one and and uh, uh they both back got back the same amount of meat well one was about 140 pound it was 180 pound they got back the same amount and he complained about it he went back grabbed some more meat brought it back out it was like <laughs> <laughs> you bring it you bring a deer that weighs 140 pounds you get this much meat okay you pull it here steaks stuff <laughs> you know so i just do it myself and and also then i can cut it the way i want it you know how are we going to eat it instead of trying to say okay i want this this and then i'd make even you know i'd make pepperoni sticks i would make all kinds of different stuff you know breakfast sausage and you know i can make it all deer if i wanted or i could mix in some beef or pork or however i wanted to mix it and you know yeah. get a lot of variety when you can you know know how to do it yourself but that's that's another whole thing i remember my first one my cousin shot one and he, he told my brother and i hey if you want to cut it up you can have half of it we'd never cut one up so we're trying to figure out how to cut it up and <laughs> yeah I don't, we don't we don't process ours i don't, I don't really have time working 12 hours yeah, but we got somebody that's been using it I guess 1998, the so Weaver's Meat Process and the Mennonite family, they they make a variety of specialty meat like that from breakfast sauces to, to uh, jalapeno and cheese uh, snack sticks and uh, a summer sausage to salisbury steak, bacon burger, just a different type, a bunch of variety of brats and uh, bologna, I mean, cured ham. They, they do a bunch of stuff and then we love it. So we just, we were happy with their services. That's what we do there. So and it's like you say, you can eat a different meal, a twenty different variety of things all year, and it's, and you just most people don't even that come over don't even know it's there, and don't don't we don't even tell them, so just let them eat it. So yeah, yeah. The, the funny part is when you get somebody, it's like, oh man, this is good. What is it? You say, dear, oh yuck. <laughs> like <laughs> you just said, you liked it. Uh, it's the the idea that you know they, you know, yeah. it's meat. You can eat it. Uh, processing has come a long way since when we first started hunting so oh so yeah proud of that so but you got it's got to be somebody you trust so uh the place we yeah. got their their state inspected fda inspected because they do deer when they're not doing deer they're doing beef and hogs and they even do emu so during the summer so they're so there's it's their job year round so they have to do a good job or they wouldn't have a business in the right and so they've been up for a long time so. Yeah, when you get somebody you can trust, then then it's worth sending it in. Um, you know, it, it's a skill that's good to know how to do. But yeah. you know, once once like you you work so many hours, you don't have the time to do it. It's much easier to to clean it and let them take care of it. And yeah, uh, yeah I can cord them up, cut back straps out, and stuff like that, and take care of that part. That ain't, that's not that big a deal. So, but when it comes to the other stuff, the bright stuff that we want, we gonna let them handle that. So it's it's a, a good partnership so. yeah cut out the the tenderloins and the back straps and take the rest in because you know that's yeah. you know the the tenderloins that that's some of the the best meat i've i've had and, yeah. um i've told this story a couple times on on the podcast but um i had the grill going i had the the back strap or the tenderloins on and i'm out there it's like, okay you know they always taper down to a point so I was like, okay, that looks like it's cooked. Cut, you know, cook, put the fork in it, cut it off. Yep, eat it, cut the other side off. And so it gets done, cut it. So I'm eating it right off the grill, put the fork in it, cut it off and eat it. And that was, oh, that was so good. I ate the whole thing just here before it didn't even take it off the grill. I just keep it as it's going. <laughs> yeah, that's some of the best meat, like you say, when it's, especially when it's fresh like that, pull off the grill or even even for breakfast with some gravy and some biscuits. Good, and it's great. But good stuff. You're always looking forward to that the first deer of the season because that's that's usually what's going to happen. That that tenderloin is going to be a breakfast or something quick. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always best if it's fresh and, and and there's not a lot to it. You know, on on a deer, they're not really that big, and right. as long as you take care and you know clean them, you know, carefully cut them open. Don't sit there with your knife and just start stabbing in there and cutting through everything and right. contaminating all the meat and 
Yeah, you be careful about that because that's on the inside. So that's you know, you know, you don't want any guts getting on that if you can help it. So. No, no, that kind of makes it not much good. <laughs> yeah, and that's why you know, lots of times I, you know, I don't use an, uh, a big hunting knife for cutting them open. You know, a lot of times, you know, we do a lot of it with a fillet knife. You know, it just cuts in there, and then it, then when they had the knives with a little zipper cut on it, and then zip it up and. You know, I don't, I don't go in. I do the hide first, then go inside, and you know, just I want it as clean as I can, and then hose it down. And uh, one of the things I thought we found by kind of by accident one time was a buddy of mine, and, and we were cleaning deer, and, and it was it was kind of you know dirty and messy from hauling it out. We wanted to hose the inside out, so he hosed the inside out, hosed the hide all down, and everything got it soaking wet. That hide come off so easy that time. So after that, we just hosed it all down and. As long as it wasn't so cold, we'd get turned in ice as soon as we hit the ground. Yeah. yeah. Here in Nebraska, we have to think about that. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know well, pulls it down on a drive, we have to drive in and out through it. Yeah, we can't do it there. But well, yeah, most of the time, like oh, we'll be a mile, a mile and a half away from a road or whatever. So we have to we have to go ahead and you know, field dress ours first and to get to make them a little bit lighter and then get a cart, whatever, and it takes four or five hours or so to get them out. So we We'll uh, have to take care of the gut stuff right off the bat or as soon as we can to, to eliminate that weight and the, any contamination or spoilage issues because we're yeah. generally we're generally warmer down here than y'all are. So yeah, and we still do that here. You know, when when you get them, you just field dress them, leave the gut pile for the coyotes, and you know haul the rest out because we don't want to haul out the whole weight. That's right. awful lot of extra work. Yeah. Throw them on a cart and wheel them out. And, yep. Or there've been many times we've just drug them out. You know, oh. tied a rope on them and drug them out. <laughs> yeah, we've drug them, uh, drug a hair off of one side of them there for, for years before carts come out. So. Yeah, now now that now the carts are pretty nice. I've got one that actually you can put on like a backpack. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know that that works pretty nice. Yeah, um, yeah. I've well, seen I, some where where the the hang on stand is actually uh, has wheels on it, so you can use it as a cart going in and out, and use it at tree stand when you're there and. You know, all kinds of cool stuff like that now. Right. Uh, yeah. A lot of changes since I started out and probably you started too, especially, you know, you got podcasts and <laughs> YouTube <laughs> and all that, you know, finding information to help hunt or, or help learn how to shoot bows or whatever was, was hard to find when I was young because the only thing you had for magazines was outdoor life and maybe field and stream and maybe some, a couple more, but you, you we didn't get them. And so you didn't know anything about, you know, what you got now that, for the information to get real easy, especially for hunting the south. So, so now you can man, you either get on a dang phone or computer and get all the help you want to help you know learn shoot or hunt or anything. Now, if you if you spend the time doing it, so it's pretty pretty neat. The technology has changed and stuff. So, and maps, you know, before you just took off to the wood with a paper map and a and a and a compass and and hope you could read the thing to get back when you got caught in the dark. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I carry in my backpack, I carry a, a compass just so, you know, don't, you know, if I get disoriented, I can go there. And I was hunting one, the public property that I was hunting, there's a river on one side and I, I knew it was that. And I had a buddy had his tree stand up and I'd walked in, walked straight to my tree stand lots of times. Well, I wanted to take him where we'd set his stand up. So I took him in there and I cut across to go to my tree stand. I actually walked underneath it and didn't even notice it. Got further up and I knew the area. It's like, okay, I'm not where I need to be. It's like, what? But I'm the other way. And I was like, okay, now I know I, I don't even know where I'm at. So I call up my compass, like, okay, I know if I go east, I get back out to the, the road, to the service road. So, like, sure enough, I cut there, come back in, walk straight to my tree stand. I'm like, <laughs> and, and I wasn't that far away. I knew where to go because I knew where my tree stand was. And I walked right, right to it and right underneath it and passed it. <laughs> Yeah. it's in the dark you know the dark changes a lot of stuff you know and then you can get turned around in the dark in just a little bit so we've actually spent the night one time lost you know so well, it can happen to anybody the best anybody so it's always be prepared you know like I say we're having a compass and i'll keep a you know you got your phone but for backup i'll keep a regular old handheld gps in my backpack you know with some batteries just in case you know so keeping your trucks marked and you know, stuff marked like on that you know, my wife knows how to find you know, on Onyx, you know, to tell somebody if I don't come back, stuff like that. So technology has, has made things easier to a point. So it's, you know, 
and worse to a point in some things because it's, you know, some people are, are losing some of the basic skills. You know, they're forgetting about doing that first. And, but anyway, it's a, it is a blessing in disguise. Yeah, use them but don't depend on them. Know how to do it without them. And then just like, okay, uh, which way? You know, compass, no electronics. It's always going to work for you. Well, not always, but I mean, you know, most of the time it's going to work for you unless something weird's going on. But it was like, okay, now I know which way to go. I know which way to come in and, you know, help you find out where you're at. And I know GPSs are, are really, I had a handheld uh, Magellan for, I'm not sure what I ever did with it, but it, it you know, they work really good. I was able to take when I went out moose hunting in Canada, I was up by Ear Falls, Ontario. And I asked the, the owners, like, what's the coordinates, the that long coordinates for? Because I just plugged them in in GPS. But they had no clue what it was. Uh, <laughs> so I got I got a topo map because the area, because again, I didn't know what it was like. So I got the topo map. And, and of course, they all have the lat longs on it. And I measured all of them, calculated what it was and plugged it into GPS. And, you know, I, I had it plugged in while I was going up to Canada. And, and sure enough, it said, turn down this road. That was the right road. You know, because I knew which road I was going to go down. It's a turn down there. And I got there, and this is where the main cabin was, which I tried to guess is off to the left, probably about 30, 40 feet. Well, it said where I'm supposed to go is about 30, 40 feet to the other way. And that's just pulling rough guessing off of the map. You know, I didn't have the actual coordinates, but I was able to pull it off and measure, okay, here's the distance between here, divide it all out and figure it. So I missed by, um, you know, maybe 100 feet. Wow. 200 feet <laughs> you know me yeah. measuring off a map so i was close enough yeah. and considering back then you know your 30 feet is the best you could get from the gps signal anyway right. you know because at that time the the military had more accurate ones but they they put, introduced an error uh, for all the civilian gps's and best you could do there was like 30 feet was the best you could get down to and, right. and now they're they're so accurate you can use them for measuring stuff even <laughs> yeah yeah that technology is something else so. yeah it's it definitely definitely worth it <laughs> you know to learn how to do it without it and you know i then i can look at them and you know then you have to go out and do some searching and know you can get back where you're going and depend on the gps that, to know how to get back there you, you get everything all verified and you know but you've got to go out and use it in places that not normal and one thing i found with the gps is, is they're going to take you straight line well yeah. it might be across the swamp so you have to walk around and the thing i found is you know up there in canada you know might be walking on what you think is solid ground but there might be a couple of feet of water underneath because it's all layer of trees and everything else so you walk around it and sure enough the gps kept readjusting my point no matter where i walked is it keep going here right yeah so then I knew, okay, this it it's working. I can depend on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep one of them in my back, one of them in my backpack, and just go along with my phone. So you know, so. there's a lot of a cool different kind of apps now that you can get on, or you know, on X Hunt Stand, and uh, uh, they got a new one. I'm trying to think of. I'm fixing to start trying it, and I can't even think the name of it. I hate I hate that right now, but it's a uh, Spartan Forge. So. You know, it's got some military stuff with it, so it's a it's a real cool looking app. So, a lot of things that you can use like that, seeing different terrain features and stuff. That if you're interested in hunting different types of terrain and stuff, that'll show all that. So that's that's all that's real neat technology, and it, and it helps a lot. Yeah, that's that's one thing with you know technology is advancing, and then and then you know some of us you know want to keep the, the newest, best, fastest bow in kit. You know, every year they come on a new model. You want to keep up the new model, keep up the new model. Um, and then others will go, okay, okay, how hard can I make this? You know, what challenge can I add? And then you have others like me that, you know, my hunting bow is a 2001 PSE. Uh, the next bow I have is a 2003 PSE. And then I have a later one that I bought when I worked at Cabela's that was a return with some problems. And being a bow tech, I know how to fix them. Making strings, I know how to fix the strings. So, hey, I'll buy a nine hundred dollar bow for one hundred and fifty bucks. <laughs> you, go, yeah. you know, I, I can I can fix this screw if 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 it's stripped out. I can I can fix it and 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 I can make new strings and cables and you know that's something I've been doing. So, um, you know, hey, why not? 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't buy a whole lot of new stuff like that. I, I, my bow was an older man. If you use it, it's before the, you know, before they went back to the binary cams or the double cam stuff like that. Mine's still a solo cam. And so it's just, a, you know, it's not a split limb. So I, I feel like you, once you get comfortable and, and, and trust something like that, it's, I don't like changing up every year because you got to get, you got to learn how that piece of equipment is again. And I like being more familiar with it when I'm, when I go into hunting versus have something that's pretty new and, and you might not have worked out all the bugs out of it. So, so I, but if anybody, I mean, I'm not telling anybody else not to do that, but I just like, I like making sure that I'm know that bow, like at the back of my hand or my gun or whatever. That way, when it comes time to, to put it to use, you know exactly what, what, where it's going to be at, how it feels and all that. So, well, with a new piece of equipment, I like, if you're going to do it, I would do it right, right now. As soon as the season's over with, you know, get into that and start shooting and practicing with it and actually climbing tree with it, how it is you need to use it, pulling it up and then shooting from the tree and all that and get, get where you can be, like I say, as comfortable with it as you can and know what piece, new piece of equipment before season starts. That way you, you're ready to go and man, have your confidence built up. There's all there's one old saying that somebody told me years ago was seven P's. Prior proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. So uh, <laughs> I, I try to I try to stay with that. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that was probably somebody when you was in the Navy, right? <laughs> it was actually when I was in high school. Was old, old, oh. old, older guy told me that. So I've stuck with that. <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to be surprised by something. If you're surprised by something that didn't work, you know, it's on you. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that's something uh, you know that you just got to be prepared for the season, and, and you know owning an archery store for a while, nobody does that. Yeah, they they come in, they pull their bow out two weeks before time to go shoot. Uh, hunting season starts in two weeks, and they pull it out, and their string is their string is broke, and then they come in and say, "Hey, is it normal for your string to break while it's in the case?" And I'll open the case up, and there's broadheads exposed in the case uh yes this is that bright head touches that string it breaks you know or and everything they come in the last minute it's like um I, I need i need something new and you put something new on it and well go over in the range and do some shooting oh, i'm good uh, it will be good uh yeah <laughs> and and that's just something that you know we go through you know that that month before season you know making air because i used to make i didn't have any arrows that were pre-made it's all just raw shaft and that way we cut them to your length we put the inserts in them we fletch them whether you want veins or feathers and you pick your own colors you know everything was a custom made arrow because you picked your own colors and it's so our jigs you know i had a dozen of the the plastic bpes and i had eight bits and burgers and i had a joe jan and they were all busy you know as soon as they dried come out next one in and constantly fletching you know and right right before the season and you know that's that's something you just got to keep you know prepared and uh, and then of course i'm ready to go hunting and i ain't had a chance to work on my boat because i'm working on everybody else's <laughs> yeah uh, that's, that's the hard part of having, having that kind of business you know tax derby <laughs> business or, or store you know archery shops or, or outdoor store it's gonna make it tough when the season comes around because that's the busiest time so uh, I, I had my hunting bow. I needed a new string on it. And it's like, okay. And it finally broke, you know, because it was so old. And yeah. I'm like, okay, I need a new string. I think it was two years later before I finally got my string on it. Wow. I, I just said, I just had to make the string. And it's like, everything is going on. I just so busy. I couldn't even work on my own stuff. And <laughs> yeah, I carry my stuff like right now, which I, every two years, I change my string on mine and my wife's stuff. So. So I, and it's time for her bow to get done this year. I've done mine last year. Every two years, regardless, we're changing strings out, so whether they need it or not. So, because I don't want any kind of, you know, I don't want it to fall back on me being a failure. So, so right. So. That's like when I was shooting aluminum arrows. Every year, I'd buy a new dozen arrows right before hunting season, and I was buying the double X seventy eights, which is you know, uh, one and a half thousand straightness, which is the straightest right. you get in aluminum. Right. And the carbons you get down to one, but I would I I'd get them so the, they were expensive arrows at that time. You know, for me now, what I was paying then is cheap. <laughs> but 
you know, yeah. every year I'd have new arrows. So I may shoot the arrow enough to get the broadhead tuned in. And I may have only shot it, you know, three or four times before it got destroyed on a deer. It was a brand new arrow. Yeah. But when you look at uh, your groups, you know, you got a nice tight group. You know, it, it, you're may not all in the X ring, but you're all in a single spot, you know, all, all in the white. And then they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, by the time there, you, you're lucky to keep all of them in the white ring, you know, on, on the single spot and get new arrows and they tighten right back up. Well, carbons don't normally have that, but if you shoot thousands of times, you can still have that. But, you know, basically carbons are straight or broke. And uh, aluminums, you know, how do you break a piece of aluminum? You keep bending it. Well, if you've ever seen slow motion of an arrow going, oh yeah, oh man, it it flexes like crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, a lot that, of flex in it. Yeah, they only take so many flexes. <laughs> so, so. It, yeah, that flexing on there warp, warps them up and just it's just stress on that aluminum. I haven't shot aluminum arrow in a long time, so I'm a. Uh, I'm a big fan of like the ACC style. That's what I've shot most of the time. Now I'm shooting like a small carbon over aluminum, AC, AC injections, I think. Then, I, then they don't even make them no more. So I'll have to next year or so, I'm going to have to change that and find me a different style area. But I love the small diameter area with a, with a penetrate, with the penetration and less wind drift and stuff like that. You have to take longer shots. So, so that's what I like shooting. Yeah, and when I was doing alums, it was a 2512, so it was a big old fat one. <laughs> but way over, you know, in the charters, way over spine for my bow, but they yeah. shot perfectly. And, uh, and now I, I I shoot, you know, I got PSC arrows, the carbon arrows that I shoot now. And, you know, they're they're not the really super skinny ones, but they're just kind of a normal style. And they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're a good shaft. And I got enough of them that I don't think I'll ever go through a ball. <laughs> wow. You thought so you played you thought ahead of time. So that's what I should have done. So. Yeah, well, when I had the store when I knew I was closing it, uh, so I had the comp pros, which is the one thousandths in a three hundred spine is what I shoot. And so all of them went into, okay, these are my arrows. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not gonna get rid of those. And then the comp pro two hundreds, which my kids would shoot, I pulled those out for my kids that were shooting a little bit less weight. And then arrows, the rest of them, I just I just sold all the rest of them off because I wasn't going to shoot them. I want I want really straight arrows and uh, makes makes a difference, makes a big difference because you know if you 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 can't hold a tighter group and then you put a broadhead on it and that even opens up your group even more. So yeah, especially with fixed blades, you know. So I'm a I'm a shooting mechanical when I'm hunting, so the fixed blades you know. With the bows have got so fast nowadays, everything's got to be perfect for a fixed blade to fly, you know, real good past 30 yards or something. So, so I'm staying on the mechanicals to to eliminate that problem. So, and uh, I have good luck with mechanical working for me deer hunting. So that's what I do. So, if I was to shoot a fixed blade, I I like more cut and I want more damage. So I would shoot a, a minimum of three blade, preferably probably a four blade. Just to, I like the I like more cut. You know, so, and and uh, so that's what I like to do some more damage even with my bullets and my guns and stuff i like a little bit bigger bullet than most people would shoot because i want it to but especially with public land you don't want any any variables that can stop you from or eliminate you getting the deer or whatever so i'm, I'm shooting a little bit bigger and a little bit more damage on bullets and uh, broad hits yeah i know on uh my ot six that i use for deer hunting i have an 180 grain uh, point that i use on it yeah, a lot of them use 150s. I'm using the 180s and it's sighted in for the 180s. I worked up a load for it because I reload as well. Um, I, I worked up a load. I tested it down at the uh, indoor range at 26 yards and was able to work up a load to put three shots in the same hole. You could see just a little bit of a, a rubbing on them. So it was off by not even a millimeter. And then I worked up a load for my 270, three shots, one hole. Couldn't tell there's more than one shot in it. And, you know, that's, you know, there I go with like 150s because it's a little bit smaller, smaller gun. But, you know, you, you just got to, you know, go with what what you like. And and I shoot 100 grain broadheads, three blade, and just because it flies really good out of my bow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I shoot 100 grain uh, 
mechanical. I shoot a, right now. I'm, I'm Spitfire is what I've, I've been shooting them for years. That's that's what I use. Um, I don't unless they quit making them. I probably keep shooting them. But I can't shoot a bow no more. So and I've had good luck with them bears and you know big deer and stuff like that. So that's just they cut. You know they cut a lot from big holes. So that's that's what I want. So that's what I'm gonna stick with. Yeah, I had had the guys on um, here um, a week ago. Or so uh, from Thorn Broadheads, and they have a fixed blade that it looks wicked. <laughs> There's actually four sets of blades getting smaller as they spiral around, and, and it's like it's it looks like it's just going to drill a hole yeah. through whatever it hits. <laughs> And they have most, they have all the rest of them are mechanicals of different kinds. That's the do, but they do have one fixed blade that looks really, really good and, and really tough made one. So um, I'm kind of might curious to you know, check out one of their their blades and next season got, and see how it goes. You can see on that wall, I don't know if you can see them on the wall, but I got a variety of fixed, old fixed blades, bought heads from back in the 70s and stuff. And that's. Oh, yeah. So it's pretty cool stuff, you know. There's some of that people are starting to come back to, kind of similar. But there's a brown and broadhead from the old days that had a had a curl to it that that would cut a big old hole like out of an apple or something. You shot into it because it had a a curl. Oh yeah, looking. spiral. I remember that one. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of cool. You'll see some newer stuff that come back at similar to them things back in the older days that they had because they tried. There was all kind of uh, fixed by broadheads back in them days that you could try. So. I've got a decent collection of them on the wall that that were shot over the years. I just you know just hang them up so with different kind of aluminum arrows and stuff. So, but yeah, I let it's it's, it's just, they got some neat looking mechanical and big broadheads nowadays. You can you can you can satisfy whatever you want now. So, right, yeah, they're they're just uh, uh, the technology advanced so far. And I remember when I was looking for my my first sight to replace. Uh, you, you remember they had the little bar had the two little grooves in it and you put your pins in there and you loosen the nut up and then you can turn the pin in or out and tighten it down and then you have to move it up and down and you got okay I need to move it just a little bit and then you move it too far and you know I wanted something else and I looked all over trying to find one and the local shop finally had one it was okay and you know looking at that compared to what they have now uh it's not still not even in the same ball game but that was a really good sight at the time. Uh, yeah, and the, the tolerances, like you say, is way different. Than back then, you you'd get a pack of six broadheads, and you might find two that would shoot, you know, halfway decent. So, so it, it, it's a bigger thing. And, and now, you know, y'all people don't even have to shoot the broadheads that much. Boy, used to you tuning your broadheads specifically to a certain era, you know, and then writing on them which right. one went to one era and stuff. So, so it's it's all like I say, the technology and the thing we got nowadays is a lot better, you know, as far as that quality and, and you know straightness and consistency and you know so weights, you know, a lot of things that straight are a lot better on the tolerances. Yeah, I I, I took in uh, um, just mine and and with the fixed blade, I normally line it up with the fletching lines because I use three blade and three fletching, so I line them up. That uh, seems to work the best. Uh, uh, but what I had, well, I'm out with something called a U-bar, which is a coned washer and a rubber O-ring. So you'd put you'd put the washer on, the, the rubber O-ring on, then the U-bar on, and screw it in. And, and that rubber, you could squeeze it down and tighten it and adjust it. So as you're shooting your broadhead, you would put in, you know, dull blades, or they'd be dull after you shot with them. And right. then you would, you could tweak them a little bit tighter, a little bit looser, and you could actually de- uh, determine where the broadhead was going to go. You could adjust it, uh, so you you'd get it there. And and I found on my muzzies with the bow I hunt with my 2001 PSE that um, they all group together, but not where the field points group. So I know on that bow, if I shoot field tips, they're going to shoot a little bit differently, you know, because the broad, you know, I, I'm going to shoot a little bit high into the right, and right. so. When I when I take and and shoot my broadheads, I know they're on. So if I shoot field tips, I, I know they're not going to hit where where I'm where I'm aiming, but I still aim at the same spot. And I now I can work on anything else. And, right. and you know, as they get faster, the bows get faster and faster and faster. It makes it harder and harder to tune them in. And, and that's where 
the the fast bows, you know, even though, you know, I'm a, I'm fond of make uh, fixed blades. I've been shooting a muzzy since the first broad I ever bought was a muzzy, and I've that's all I've ever shot. Uh, but I don't have one of these uh, super fast bows. Um, although my bow was rated at 320 feet per second, a 2001 bow. Wow. You know, so so they haven't advanced a whole lot faster than that. But I, I noticed shooting that one over the one bow I had before that, they're faster. It, it's a little bit more picky on where I can shoot. You know, the bow I had before that one, you know, I could line them up even or I could do them 180 degrees off. And it, it, it shot. That was just fine. It was just a little different bow. And, you know, it's it just just a matter of, you know, what do you like? And every time you get a new bow, something's different. I know one time when I was a PSCD, the Browning come out with uh, a bow that had counter rotating camps. So as you drew back, one rotated towards you, one rotated away from you. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I, I So I tried shooting it. I could not get it to fit me for nothing. And I'm like, I can't shoot this, but I wanted to shoot it. I couldn't shoot it because it just would not fit me. Oh. And, and, and that's what you got to do is like, that's what I always tell when a new archer come in wants to figure out, you know, the right eye or left eye dominant and what they're looking for. They're looking for compounds or do whatever. So if they're looking for compounds, it's like, okay, uh, take if they're left handed here, grab all the left handed bows, hold them. Which one feels good? And that one. So then we'd shoot that one and just that's the thing. It's got to feel good to you. And, and that's that's why, you know, well, besides the cost of the new bows now, I don't want to spend the money. I'm too cheap. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I want to spend money on something else. <laughs> yeah, they're pricey now. They you about buy you about go on a good hunt somewhere <laughs> for some of them bows, especially them crossbows. They got crossbows now at four or five thousand dollars. It's good. Right, right. There's there's some out there that are really expensive like that. And but when you look at it compared to uh you know the the higher end ones, it costs more as opposed well to the cheaper ones, the low end ones. Uh, um you know, not to bash, but Barnett used to be. And Horton used to be the names in crossbows. Mm -hmm. If you want a crossbow, good quality, Barnett or Horton. Horton. And now uh, Horton got sold out and bought by um, 10 point, but Barnett's still making them. And a few years ago when I was actually assembling them, I hated to assemble a Barnett. There was constant problems with it. Nothing fit right. Um, you know, once it got going, they weren't too bad as opposed to like a 10 point. But you're looking at a, a probably a, a, a five to six hundred dollar bow as opposed to a fifteen hundred or two, you know, twelve to fifteen hundred bow. So you yeah. can kind of expect it. But I did talk to one guy that has, you know, the, the new Barnett seemed to they seem to fix some of the problems they had. So I don't know. I haven't I haven't been working on them for a while now. So uh, that's just just my experience and. Yeah, you gotta find what fits you and what's comfortable, and you know, and, and you know, make that work. You know, and be you gotta be comfortable with it. So, like we like we talked about earlier, you know, you know, get comfortable with it and, and make sure it works for you, and then you know, and, and practice with it, and practice and practice. You know, in different different ways, different positions, different. So you ground hunting, blind hunting, tree stand hunting, or whatever. You know, put it in actual hunting situations and, and make sure that it's gonna work for you. And do it before season starts. <laughs> right. And, and take some of those weird, weird angled shots and see, you know, you know, you got your normal stance, you're gonna shoot, you practice good. Okay, now now turn a little bit more and turn it to waist. And now see what you can do, you know, and turn the other way. So now they're you're trying to keep your form. And, and then you know, like is it get on a platform and try shooting down, keeping your form, you know, or yeah. get on your knees yeah. <clears throat> or or sitting down. Um no, I was talking about a, a stock I did on a deer was bedded down next to a little drive area that was had some brush on the side. And I got all the way up to about five feet away from it. And then I'm figuring, how am I going to shoot? Because I can't get up to shoot. I can't stand up because I'm five feet away from it. <laughs> so I'd never practiced or even thought about, you know, okay, once I get there, what am I going to do? How can I shoot? Because you can't shoot laying down on your back. Right. The arrow won't stay on there. Um, okay. You could go on your belly, if, like on a, a, a recurve or longbow, but you can't do that with a compound. Uh, yeah. You know, so so at least you got to get up and and at least get on your knees 
and I'd never shot that way. I'd never even thought about it. And, uh, but I had I had fun sneaking up on it. Took my boots off and went in my wool socks <laughs> to get there. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was fun, but uh I, I learned a bunch <laughs> from it. It's like what what can I do next time? Yeah. Yeah, and always learn. Like I say, you learn from that, and learn what you could do better next time, and you know, and be practiced a little bit for it, and try to prepare for that. So. Yeah, I have to do that. I don't, I don't do a lot of sneaking around anymore, but I try to just get to my tree stand and wait. As you get older, you don't want to do all that walking if you don't have to. <laughs> walk in, walk out, ride the four wheeler close, and and get <laughs> off of it, and go eat a tree stand. <laughs> You don't ever know, you know, if you're walking back at lunch or whatever, you might walk up on one and be, you know, kind of be prepared if that situation happens, that you're kind of ready for it. Because you don't know, like we were talking about earlier, a buck or especially a buck will surprise you when you're going to see it, where you're going to see it. So Right. So you got to try to be prepared for them situations because they, cause they, they'll come out of the blue, pop up out of the ground or whatever in front of you. So. Yeah, I know one time my, my son and I were walking out, it had been raining, it's supposed to quit raining, it had quit raining. And he says, you know what, they're still talking about going longer and longer. And we didn't want to hunt in the rain. So we're walking out. And here come, here this deer is up in front of us. So I told him, I was like, okay, I'm going to stand here looking at me. You stand behind me. You get ready. And, and then and then you kind of step off to the side and, you know, and get your shot. But it didn't wait long enough for to do that. But, you know, it's like, okay, they're looking at me, but they're not looking at you because you're behind me. <laughs> you just never know. That's and right. practice for that. Yeah. yeah, you start hunting when you get up. You start and stop hunting when you get home. <laughs> we try to yeah. all the time. So yeah, you're constantly looking. You know, whenever I'm driving, uh, whether I'm driving or passenger, it's like I'm always looking off the side into the fields and like, oh, there's a deer. There's a bunch of deer. <laughs> yeah. You know, trying to figure out where they're at. It's like, okay, let's see. Can I get permission to hunt there? Yeah. Uh, no, probably not there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have any uh, uh, parting thoughts to tell our, our audience before we get out of here? No, just uh, I've, I've enjoyed the podcast and uh, the video part of it. That's neat. Uh, keep, you know, keep, keep after it. Love to talk about, you know, right now is a great time. If you're a deer hunter right now and up there, I guess for y'all, y'all could have already been out post-season scouting because post-season scouting is one of my favorite things to do because you can tell what was going on at the end of the season where right. where pressure deer got moved to, where they went to to find late season food. We had a bad year about uh, mass crop. We didn't have any mass crop, so the deer had to adjust to different types of browse and uh, it kind of messed up a lot of hunters. So. Be aware of that and find, you know, note where all your different type of browse or mass crop stuff is and where the deer are right now, the rub, scrape, you know, bedding areas, you know, and if you can find sheds, looking for sheds, you know, here, if I can find a shed late season, then I know it's, you know, kind of in its core area, so it gives you an idea what to look for, the terrain, and kind of, kind of get planning for the season coming up, but we do a lot of walking and scouting this time of the year, trying to make plans for next year and looking at the new areas and stuff like that so and if you got your bow equipment or um, any kind of hunting equipment go over start going over some of that and put it up where it's in working condition in good condition and uh and get your bow ready if you need a new string or stuff like that and keep practicing you know you know the archery wheel 3d tournaments start coming up stuff like that dot shoot you know keep keep your form and stuff because if you go Go dry for a while, not practicing. You know, you got to build your muscles back up and all that stuff. So keep after that and then um, share it with friends and family and then keep enjoying this type of technology that we've got now where we can talk to each other and, and share tips and tactics and styles from different states and different parts of the world. It, it makes it brings us all together because we're all hunters and we're all gatherers and we're all u- unique people and we're a part of this great earth and we need each other to, to share this stuff and to, to keep it going. So. Yeah, good good points. It, that's something we all need to keep in mind when we're when we're out here. That you know we're we're all uh, um, archers or all kind of a small community that you know willing to help each other out and and, and it's 
it's fun. There's just something about archers that, you know, we have this connection. We find that you're an archer, you're immediate friend. Right. And, you know, we've right. talked about that many times on, that's kind of a common thing amongst the, everybody I get on the podcast is like, hey, you know, it's it's all big, all, all big family. And no matter where you're at, you know, we may have to use the phone to translate the, what we're saying, but mm -hmm. it's a friend. We can't talk to them in our own language because they speak a different language. But you know what? With these phones, you can yeah. translate them. You right know, Google has a translate. You can type in and then it'll translate to whatever language you can show it to them. And then, and then they can... So you could actually talk to an archer and, and oh, not say a word, you know, and then there's the, the voice translations. and Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I went to France two years ago for my work, and that's what we've done. We use that. Yeah, you use that Google Translate to, to talk back and forth with the ones that couldn't speak English or I couldn't speak French anyway, so but they helped me out with that. So, but yeah, yeah, archer, archery is since it's a, it's a close proximity sport and you're, you're you're more in touch or in tune with animal the actually how it moves and uses edges and woods and, and stuff like that so you're and versus gun hunting or whatever it's longer distance you're not in you know that much up and close and personal so it puts you out more close and personal with the people because there's a lot of you know it's a lot of it's a lot easier to have archery tournament stuff like that versus going on gun tournaments or whatever so so it's a it's a unique family and then a, a good kinship so uh just stick with it and and try to meet more new people and share it and keep enjoying it so but well, i'd like to thank you for being on on the show today it's it's been a lot of fun talking to you and looking forward to talking to you in the future well, i appreciate it thank you thanks for having me yeah now my name is roy canterbury i've been your host today on arch talk 101 with michael perry and we'll see you on the next one